Yes, yes. He said, absolutely no neurons firing inside of his skull. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, he claimed, the inside of his brain full of as much kinetic energy as the zero Kelvin depths of space. Dude, this is such a good grift. All of the videos, almost all of them, are old clips from his lectures and like shorts from those clips. Some of this is like years old. Oh, there's Russell Brand. This is a very funny thing. Whoa, rocking a beard. What are you, some kind of beatnik, you fucking hippie? So the ancient, the emperor of ancient Mesopotamia. So this is some of the earliest political documentation we have, by the way. Please, give me anything other. Just give me something new. Mesopotamia, make me Google something to debunk your stupid points. Yes, please. Oh, yes. What they used to do to the emperor every New Year's Day. They would take him outside the walls of the city. So he was responsible for everything within the walls. Outside was chaos and the unknown. They'd take him outside the city. They'd strip him of all his emperor garb. So he's no longer emperor. They'd make him kneel. They'd humiliate him. I think, the, if I remember correctly, the priest would hit him with a glove and say, okay, in the last year, how... Name all the ways that you didn't embody Marduk. Marduk was the god of the Mesopotamians, and Marduk was the thing that took on the great dragon of chaos. And so it was the, it was the responsibility of the emperor to, to kneel down and say, here's all the ways that I haven't been acting out my proper self and have brought the kingdom into disarray. And then he would be forgiven. They would act out the reconstruction of the cosmos. That was the New Year's celebration. Okay, I have no way of knowing if any of this is true. I am considering this set up for what will no doubt be a collection of prescriptive positions that I am interested in. Uh, but I can't really check this. Also, he has a Pellegrino? Wait, isn't this his signature drink? Or am I thinking of somebody else? He is making it up? I, I mean, he could be making all this up. I care more about, like, the modern prescription than the historical allegory. And then he'd go in and try to be a good king. I like that. So yeah, yeah, no kidding. Absolutely. It's That's like water. the confession of the water. emperor. Is Here's it, the way I haven't been good. Are there any comparable of... Uh... Some of it is true, but they would just make a random guy the king for a day, then sacrifice him. Is that true? The solar eclipse and the substitute king. There's our boy Carl. If the, if the solar eclipse took place over Assyria, for instance, the Assyrian king would be in danger, and for the king to be put in danger put the entire power structure of the kingdom at risk. So a substitute would be put in his place, literally a substitute king. The substitute king didn't have to look like the real king, but had to be a man. After he was selected, he was dressed in the king's garment, declared to be the king, and made to participate in the other rituals, investing him with royal identity. He was also given a young woman as a queen. Damn! After this, the true king withdrew from public view until danger had passed. The substitute, uh, substitute king and queen were offered as sacrifices for the evil fate that was destined for the true king, taking it on themselves while he remained safely hidden. Is this the same ritual? No, Vosh, that's another thing? Oh, okay. What Peterson was talking about used to happen in Babylon, not Assyria? Oh. What sort of rituals really went on inside late Babylonian temples? Oh, God, there's a lot here. Oh, boy. You know what? Everything they say is completely true. I sign off on it. Are the powerful held up to that kind of evaluation? In we don't have rituals for now? that. Well, I think because we don't acknowledge the emergence of order from chaos. We don't uh, uh, emerge uh, acknowledge divine principles. So the power. The king wasn't slapped with a glove. He was slapped by the head priest, and it had to be hard enough to make the king cry. Damn, you have to slap somebody pretty hard to reliably make them cry. Okay, fuck yeah, all right, fuck yeah. Absolutely. Powerful, and I think this is possibly because of an assumed meritocracy. That, you know, people that are in positions of power, they're there for a reason. You don't need yeah. to start stripping them naked and taking them outside yeah. the city and saying, how often did you wank in that Oval Office yeah. every day? <laughs> yeah. Get out. Yeah, well, I, I, th I think there might be something to that, and that's the danger of pride that goes along with ascension and hierarchy. Well, because I'm here in this position, I must deserve it. It's mm. like, yeah, but there should still be something that you're bowing down to, and that might be the abstract idea of sovereign authority itself, mm. if you think about it only psychologically. Mm. But that's a figure that essentially has a... a a t touch of divinity about it because yes. it's the monarchy. perfect idea. We're in a monarchy right now, huh? So that's the, the queen, the anointed and appointed monarch. She represents, you know, I suppose in a post secular nation, she becomes the emblem of Britain rather mm. than the, the emblem of God on right. Well, Earth. I think I think it actually functions to some degree in the same in a, way. In, well, I do think so because the queen, your queen in particular, our queen as well, because I'm oh, Canadian, yeah, you're Canadian. You know, I mean, I that's think Elizabeth right. has been uh, 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 an embodiment of moral virtue. I mean, she's done a remarkable job over the last, what is it, 75 years now. She's held herself to an incredibly high moral standard. And I think she does sit in the background as emblematic of what 
sovereign authority might look like. But of course, you're postmodernist, and this is an area where, because you know, I'm English and I can't get away from the love of the Queen, but I would also say that she is an emblem of authority. How can Russell Brand, somebody who claims to stand against the elites and like unearned power being concentrated in hierarchy, possibly love the Queen? Because he doesn't actually believe anything? Yeah, that's probably the correct answer. I'm pretty sure that was probably just a joke, a bad one, but still. Has he ever made a joke like that about any other power structure or institution that he criticizes in a way that sounds kind of left-leaning but actually reinforces conservative policy positions? I don't really know. And of power and of wealth and land ownership mm -hmm. and that there is that there is an order that ought to be respected and can't be challenged. Every so often this country sort of toys with the idea of republicanism. They're always mm -hmm. grateful when there's a wedding like there is this week so that no one has to think, is this right <laughs> that we're right, paying right. for this bizarre right. this spectacle? Yeah, well, but it, but it is useful to think about it in a symbolic sense. I mean, one of the things that constantly threatens the United States, I think there should be four branches of government, legislative, judicial, um, um, executive and symbolic. Because the problem in the United States is the president keeps tilting towards king. You know, the Americans like the idea of... It is absolutely remarkable the effectiveness with which with these two... I think it actually kind of speaks to Jordan Peterson's um, tendencies that this is kind of like a conversation between equals and you have a PhD and you have like a retard on the other side. I mean, they're both retarded, but you know, like you have like the great, the great joining of the minds here. Because as it turns out, there's actually a very like like low bar when it comes to spewing this kind of drivel, J just like vomiting this like like weed brownies at at eleven p.m. bullshit. The first family and the first lady, mm. and it's like yeah, no, <laughs> and and it, and it kind of tilts towards a dynasty, and you've seen that happen with mm. the Bushes and the Clintons. And it's not it's it's not a good thing. And it might be nice to have someone take the symbolic load off the president and just act that out. And your queen does that very nicely because all of the... He's, liter he's literally advocating for an American monarch. He's literally advocating... Okay. ...pomp and circumstance of the state and all the drama and ritual of the sovereign can be played out in that sort of dramatic space and your legislature and executive... No, the, the president is the head of state. That's the point of the president. They're literally called the head of state. If you have that pomp and circumstance put onto the shoulders of another official, then the president is no longer the head of state and it no longer functions as the executive branch. Executive branches can go off and do the administration. It's interesting that the uh, that the, the dynasties exert themselves. In a sense, it's a demonstration of your argument that there are certain hierarchical systems that find their way into fruition regardless mm. of regulation. But then I suppose there's rational reasons. They would have the resources, the experiences, mm. the, con the connections. Sure, it's it. easier for them. But that's also the, that's a danger to a republic is the fact that, and, and it's part of the potential corruption of the state, is that, well, it, it's easier for the children of those who have authority. To be fair, it doesn't need to be a monarch. A lot of countries have a prime minister who's the government head and a president who's the head of state, mostly symbolic. The U.S. president just does both. Yeah, but he's analogizing this to the queen. So he's not talking about, like, just a different, like, parliamentary system with the executive branch. He's talking about, so, like, a, 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 like a, a, a symbolic, a, a borderline mystical uh, figurehead of Americanism, of true Americana, that's meant to like lord over everyone in a in a symbolic fashion. You know what the Queen does, the Queen, and and all of this. The, the it's it, this this kind of cultural puritanism uh, is is the stuff of fascists and monarchs. You know this obsession with some kind of like pure representation of American virtue. Like listen to what he said earlier that the Queen has been acting with perfect virtue for seventy five years. No, she fucking hasn't. Absolutely not. She's been a, as I understand it, a fairly shift with the times conservative to moderate leader who's done very little to meaningfully advance the, the rights of the British people with the power and the cultural influence she holds, you know? I, I remember, it's not the Queen itself, but the royal family, where you had the, who's the, 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 the fella, the very old man, sitting on that gilded throne, talking about the need for um, austerity amidst the population. Like, he's literally sitting on a golden throne talking about how the British population needs to tighten their belts a bit. Uh, like, like, stuff like that is fucking revolting. It, it's genuinely disgusting. Yeah, sure, uh, uh, Philip, I don't know. It doesn't matter. They're all the same to me. I don't care about them. There's, there's no value whatsoever to it. The royal family has privately lobbied for exemptions from equality laws that require them to hire a POC. Oh, yeah, they wanted, uh, they wanted white people staffing the palace. So they wanted to be exempt from broader laws that ban dis racial discrimination. 
Like, the, the idea that she's acted with virtue, the, the, the only virtue with which she's acted is the Jordan Petersonian ideal of virtue, which is having, like, an, a, 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 like an uncaring, inattentive authority figure staring down at you sternly until the day you die, you know? It's the, it's the, the virtue of fascists. It's the eternal patriarch, or in her case, matriarch, you know? The, uh, the leading representation that exists to constantly turn you the eye. Authority ...to have power. And you don't want people attaining the pinnacle of achievement because of power. You want them attaining the pinnacle of achievement because of competence. competence. Yeah, yeah. And, and those yeah. things always struggle. They all, and and it, it, it takes a society that's very awake to stop the hierarchies from degenerating into hierarchies of power. Because degeneration is the tendency. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, it's easy. It's easy. You quote right? that W.B. Yeats poem, you know, that fearsome and terrifying, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the Faulkner poem. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and people have recognized that it's the proclivity of hierarchies to towards tyranny for, for really for thousands of years. Mm. I've, I've seen that as a fundamental danger to proper adaptation. We need- Wants to be exempt from everything, doesn't she? Don't know how much money I have. Don't force me to um, not engage in racial and sex discrimination when I hire. Don't hold me account for climate regulations. Just let me reign eternal as God Queen. Need hierarchies, yes, but they degenerate- Oh, and it is God Queen, isn't it? Right? The head of the royal family is literally the head of the Church of England, isn't it? Maybe not in, 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 in practice, but symbolically, you know, yeah, the head of the church. ...into tyranny, and they unfairly oppress. It's like, yes, we have to be on guard against that. But that doesn't mean that we call all hierarchies tyrannies, because that's not helpful. Or we call all productive activity service in the, in the you know, in service to the oppressive patriarchy, because that's seriously not help helpful. And we don't dispense with hierarchies, because then people don't have anything to do. So you might notice, by the way, if you're paying attention to this, the reason why I'm not commenting directly on what they're saying is because a lot of it is incoherent. I mean that sincerely. Jordan Peterson fans or like moderates get mad at me when I say that sometime. But if you actually like sit down and listen to conversations like this and break it down statement by statement, there's actually very little being said. It's um, it's it's kind of like a parallel to corporate speak. You can talk for ages without saying anything, you know, like like the way politicians are said to do, which they often do. It's, it's, there's not really that much to dig into. Oftentimes the stuff they say, like one person will follow up with something that's incoherent or not related at all to the previous statement. They'll say something blatantly wrong, but not even as part of like a prescriptive statement. They'll just, just say it like casually, like I guess for fun or for personal satisfaction. Um, there's, it's, there's not that much to dig into, unfortunately. What does it mean for someone to have nothing to do if there's no hierarchy? Nothing. That's, listen again. Um... Yes, the, you know, service to the oppressive patriarchy, because that's seriously not help helpful. You're ready. And we don't dispense with hierarchies because then people don't have anything to do. What does that mean? We don't dispense with hierarchies because then people don't have anything to do. What does that, what, what does it mean? If you wanted to be charitable, you could think it means some stuff. You could, you could inter, you could fill in the blanks and you could interpret like, well, the elimination of literally all social hierarchies would put humans exactly on the same playing field, which isn't possible, so there'd be nothing to achieve because if we'd all have already achieved parity and it reduces our drive for the... Like, if you want to add, like, six or seven or eight things, maybe you could make a somewhat coherent statement um, out of it. But, um, you know, to what extent can you reduce hierarchy? Did people have nothing to do? after uh, we got rid of slavery. I mean, again, like, if you want to, you can ascribe meaning, but on its own, it really does not mean anything. So yes. So it's, yeah, get the beam out your eye, huh? Like, mm. so, so if the individual is attuned, if the individual is a channel, I'm going to like, I, I like the prayer of St. Francis. I, I like it as a model that it invites us to find the reverse of each uh, defective characteristic that we, or sin that we mm. might be living out. Uh, to become a channel of some inherent goodness. Mm -hmm. So notice how this has nothing to do with what Jordan Peterson just said. They're not actually having a conversation. They're just trading off, like, I, I guess, like, aneurysms. Like, they're just sort of experiencing them sequentially and, and channeling them back and forth. So Jordan Peterson made a comment on the nature of hierarchy and its relationship to, um, to, to our, you know, our, our, our work within society. And uh, Russell Brand follows that up by saying that if you're attuned properly you can take a bad characteristic, find its opposite, and then try to be a vehicle for the goodness of the opposite characteristic. 
which in addition to being kind of a stupid and meaningless statement in itself has nothing to do with what Jordan Peterson said at all. We well, the, well, the, the thing that's one of the things that's interesting about that, well, two things, actually. The first is the word sin means to miss the target. It's an archery term. So that's. And now Jordan Peterson is going to ignore what Russell Barron said and hyper fixate on the use of the term sin because Jordan Peterson is the master of uh, of of moralizing uh, religious terminology, uh, but not actually engaged with what's just said, I, I assume. I mean, we'll see. It's quite that's a very interesting way of thinking about it because it means that there is a target there is a target that's the thing but the next thing is and this this comes right out of that is it's very useful to become aware of your faults because as soon as you posit a fault you posit the opposite by merely saying well that's a fault you're saying implicitly well mm -hmm. there's something that's the opposite of that so out of your recognition of faults immediately some clarity of virtue develops because you might say well this is a fault and i really know it it's like great you've got some bedrock there whatever mm -hmm. the opposite of that fault is you might not know what that is, but whatever the opposite of that fault is, is a virtue. So this is, I'm trying to think of the right term, critically retarded. Uh, no, just because something is a fault does not mean its opposite is a virtue. I cannot believe this actually needs to be said. This is, this is genuinely insane. That would be like saying that if a person has a fault, which is that um, they, they're not like a, a big risk taker, like they're, they're kind of fearful, um, that the virtue would be taking as many risks as possible all the time. Like, ah, uh, my fault is that I overeat. The virtue must be never eating. Like, absolutely not. It depends on what you define as the opposite. You know, like, perhaps the opposite of a lack of moderation is moderation. But that's because, uh, like, we're not talking about mathematics here or geometry or physics, you know. The opposite of a concept. There can be multiple opposites. What exactly is the opposite of a vice? What element of the vice is the thing you're opposing, and in what way? There's no objective way to answer this. But this, this is just a very stupid statement. Um, yeah, obviously. It's just not, like, yeah, just very, very, very dumb. And then you might say, well, look, I have 20 faults. It's like, great. The opposite of the personality that has all those 20 faults is the virtuous you, whatever that might happen to be. Well, great. Then you've, then you've conjured out of the devil um, a, a redeemer. It's no. Um, this is convenient for Jordan Petersonian thought, though, because extremely binary um, moral systems are uh, really, really common for theocrats and fascists. Uh, moral ambiguity doesn't sit well with them because it, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work with the extremity of their statements and their denunciations. You know, people have to fit in one of two categories. So um, they can't really conceive a moral system more complicated than there is vice and virtue and they are the opposites of each other. Something like that. I like that. The, he likes that. Undoubtedly, both in terms of cosmology and fleeting morality, there is chaos, there is vice. And we're on another subject again, okay? So we're not going to address the nature of vice and virtue being opposites or the ways in which vices reveal virtues through recognition. We're now on to this, okay. Lastness, but there are also patterns. Mm -hmm. There are patterns that emerge, and whether you call that pattern male or love or beauty, mm -hmm. there are various patterns. And I feel that there is, there is something to get in alignment with. There is a tune, there is harmony, there is melody, there is grace. So this is hippie bullshit. If anyone said this to you in real life, you could hit them and the cops would not arrest you because the cops hate hippies. Uh, this does not mean anything. He's, he, he might as well be humming and saying, there's a song all around us, man. Listen to the beat. Do -do 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 -do. Uh, that's it. That's the extent of the uh, communication being uh, brought about here. We're not that's all dealing expressed with in just music. And all you're using there are musical, musical um, um, what would you call, analogies or yes, musical representations. Is. That's what music expresses, is to have all of that in harmony. Yes, and people love language. music because of that. You know? No. Uh, music uh, is not actually an expression of the innate harmony and pattern finding of the universe, at least not more so than anything else. You could say the same thing about the mixing uh, properties of concrete or about the, uh, the, the, the resonant tone of a, of, of a board of wood as you smash it against a hippie's face, um, or the satisfying concussive force of a fire hose as you spray uh, 8,000 liters of water every minute onto a crowd of hippies as they try to explain to you how, like, the vibes and the pattern is all around you, man. You know, <laughs> all Jordan Peterson is really doing here is just sort of working with the bullshit that that's that's being laid on the table. You know, and those patterns, because music, you think about music, it is the harmonious interaction of patterns. And you just described all those positive 
uh, what would you call them, spirits, that's a good way of thinking about it, as patterns. Well, they are patterns. And then you might think that there's a pattern that's composed of all of those patterns. Well, that's what you're after. You're after yes. the pattern that's composed of all those patterns. Again, this means literally nothing. I'm so sorry, guys. I wish I had more to say. This means, this means absolutely nothing. Uh, no thoughts, head empty, just nothing. Yes, absolutely. And you want to put yourself in harmony with that. And that is a real thing. That's a real thing. You yeah. can feel that. So it's what keeps you alive, essentially, when you're trying to become conscious. Yes, yes. There is something important happening. I feel like uh, what we were saying before. Yes, yes. He said, absolutely no neurons firing inside of his skull. Yes, yes, he claimed. The, the, the inside of his brain, uh, full of as much kinetic energy as uh, zero Kelvin depths of space. There is something important happening. I feel that, like uh, what we were saying before about uh, the acknowledgement of difference needn't infer inferiority. That is something that mm -hmm. we must Definitely invite. not. Well, we should be actually... Well, and this is part of what the radical leftists keep saying is, well, we should celebrate diversity. It's like, yes! But what that means first is the admission that people actually differ. Okay, so we finally have hit on an actual attempt at a salient political point. So, a common conservative straw man is that leftists think that all humans are literally identical in every possible fashion. Uh, you can debunk this straw man by pointing out anything said by any leftist ever. Nobody believes this. There are obviously massive differences between individuals and between groups. Uh, the argument of the left is that we are fundamentally the same in the sense that we're all humans and deserving of respect, something that uh, Jordan Peterson would disagree with. Uh, though he might not own up to it explicitly, depending on how angry and benzo-starved he feels at that moment. And secondly, uh, 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 that um, many of the differences between humans and between groups of humans are down to environmental factors. Uh, those are the critical distinctions there, but nothing there would, denies the fact that there are fundamental differences between people, uh, uh, individuals, you know, uh, it's a fine thing to recognize. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. you don't have diversity. It's like, I'm glad there are conservatives. I'm glad there are leftists. The conservatives run things. The leftists invent them. It's like, good. What? I mean, don't get me wrong. I agree with one thing. I agree that leftists are generally the ones who spur social change forward. Inventing things being the, I don't know, like the, the, the vague descriptor, I think, kind of pulling at there. I don't know what he means by running them, though. And they're really different, those people. Like, you know, if you, if you have a group that's all conservatives and they're going down the right path, they're going to go down that path really fast. But if they're going down the wrong path, they're not going to be able to think laterally and figure out how to get out of it. If you have a group of, of left-leaning creative types, it's like they're going to come up with a hundred ideas. But the probability that they'll organize in a stable hierarchy and Im implement those effectively is zero. Actually, funnily enough, I actually kind of agree with what he's saying here in the sense that conservative groupthink tendencies are very strong and they dogmatically approach any problem in like a unified sense whereas leftists are creative and willing to challenge and explore new systems um but it's very difficult to organize them because they're being pulled in so many directions that's a valid point so i guess the solution then would be you sort of wrangle all the conservatives together and put a saddle on them and then you have all the leftists right on top of them like a palanquin and all the leftist decision making gets to direct the cohesive decisiveness of the conservatives that would be it right we essentially just need here hold on we need like the the gigantic throne that xerxes was on in 300 where's the sh here we go yeah like this we need this where all the conservatives are at the bottom using their group think and cohesion to move the lefties forward i think that's what he means i agree completely good one jordan so they're going to have to call over the conservatives. It's like, look, guys, we finally got a good idea. You can have one idea, because you're conservatives, run with it. And then they can all run with it. And so it's really good that we have people who are like that on both sides of the distribution, because otherwise the, the creative types... I actually think this dichotomy works unironically if you simply replace leftist and conservative with, like, um, revolutionary and reformist. Or more, more accurately, maybe, like, activist and bureaucrat. Or activist and politician where you have, there are people whose job it is to be disruptive, to create new ideas, to challenge existing hierarchies. And then there are people who, you know, may, maybe they're not um, 
maybe they're, they're not out here, you know, acting as, as, as revolutionaries, but they do want a good idea to build a, an administrative uh, apparatus around. Because people don't talk enough about the need for liberatory bureaucracy, but it's actually critical. No matter what system you're in, even like anarchist post-state systems, bureaucrats will always be a thing. Uh, always, always, always. They're critical. They're absolutely critical, you know? If right now there was a socialist revolution, you know who wouldn't get ousted from government? Tens of thousands of executive branch bureaucrats. Because you can't do their job. Literally, everything would fall apart. Can you imagine what would happen if a bunch of revolutionaries tried to replace all of the, like, 75-year-old veterans of the U.S. Postal Service with their own, like, ideological... Uh, 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 like aligned people, like, it would all fall apart. You need, um, you need uh, 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 bureaucrats on your side. Mao would disagree. Well, Mao starved forty million to death. So, isn't that what Lenin and Stalin did? Well, you might notice that as bad as the USSR was, it did at least continue to exist for a while. Um, the problem was their bureaucrats were doing the wrong things. But yes, you do need, you, you need bureaucrats willing to stay the course. You can't build a nation, you can't fix society just with advocates, uh, revolutionaries, and activists. You know, you need, um, you need people, you need people who are sympathetic to the revolutionary cause afterwards, who are also incredibly interested in, like, filing cabinets and the nuances of engineering protocol analysis and all that bullshit. Uh, you need to, um, you need the system. You need paperwork lovers and lawyers. So sit around and come up with new ideas till they starve to death in squalor. And, and put it. Yeah, well, exactly. And the conservatives would just ossify and, and you know, run down a, a road that got narrower and narrower and narrower, and they'd all end up stuck between two cliffs. Hmm. And that'd be the end of it for both of them. You know, it's kind of sad that this video was like nine and a half minutes of laughable bullshit and the last 30 seconds was i'm gonna be real with you actually maybe the most coherent and intelligent thing i've heard from jordan peterson in a while he said other things that are around that coherent but he does often say really dumb stuff uh huh this was before the benzo saga no it's not this is uh this is quite recent I swear to God, he does actually have some good takes. Well, I don't think Jordan Peterson is stupid. I just think he's crazy and also very biased. Uh, I think Ben Shapiro is smart. I think that Russell Brand is properly stupid. Yeah, Jordan Peterson's problem is, 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 is being delusional, I think, more so than, than anything. It's rough out there, trying to find out who's stupid, who's crazy, who's a grifter. Who's all three? Who's two of the three? Yeah. Whew! Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed that video. Oh, taking down Jordan Peterson and Russell Brand. Epic stuff there. Epic stuff. All right. Make, make sure to hit the buttons. Open your inner eye. And uh, I'll catch you in the next one. We have to do that after every Russell Brand bit. Vosh is, of course, all three. True.